Welcome to A Half Hour with HBO Docs. I'm Tom Powers, the Artistic Director of the Doc NYC Festival. Uh, we have a great group today. I'll quickly uh, introduce you to them. We've got Nate, Nancy Abraham and Lisa Heller, who are EVPs of Documentary and Family Programming at HBO. We have Sam Pollard, the Director of Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children. Aaron Lee Carr, the Director of I Love You, Now Die, The Commonwealth versus Michelle Carter, and Brian Lazarte, the director, executive producer, writer, and editor of McMillions. So uh, Nancy and Lisa, I wanna start with you. Um, we have a booming documentary field right now with lots of outlets getting on board, but HBO has been in this field for a long time. And I mean, I think of one of the things that's changed recently is the emergence of doc series that are represented by uh, today's projects. It really feels like it got kickstarted by HBO in, in 2005, 15 with uh, the Jinx. I wonder how you describe HBO's focus of documentaries today. Um, yeah, it's interesting. The series have had a very warm embrace in the doc space. We're very lucky, and I think it's the case with all of the projects on this panel that we can uh, really let the story drive how many episodes it requires to a certain extent. And often, uh, as in the case of these projects, some, uh, some part of the way into the project, it's revealed that it needs uh, to expand, that the best expression of the story we're trying to tell needs, needs more space on the network. And so we're still looking for stories that are um, fresh takes on th something you thought you might know uh, deeper and with more breadth and depth beyond the headlines. Um, but in terms of the episode length, we're increasingly open to seeing what a story needs. So, I mean, Nancy, the three projects we're talking about today, you could call them crime stories, but they're also stories about justice. I wonder what you, what you think about this genre that makes it so enduring, uh, you know, that we're seeing so many of these kinds of stories. Yeah, I think all of these films and series featured on the panel here today are examples of um, stories that are about crime in some sense, but that also take a deeper look at the, the underlying uh, sort of issues behind those crimes, understanding them in a new light and um, not just thinking about the crime itself, but what it tells us about society more generally. Well, uh, let's look at one of these. We're gonna start with a 30-second uh, spot for Atlanta's Missing and Murdered uh, that Sam Pollard directed. Let's watch that. It was the New South. This was supposed to be the city where Black folks had all this opportunity. The Black Mecca was more myth than reality. These young people were murdered, and their cases were never solved. There's no memorial. There's nothing in this city other than your memory. This is a case of politics, greed, racism, and murder. It's been 40 years. It's prudent to review the case. Our goal is to get this right. Do what should have been done. Solve the cases. If they pursue this, it's going to destroy the Atlanta name for a while. It would turn Atlanta into the real Atlanta. Sam, uh, a few years ago, you directed a film about Maynard Jackson, who was Atlanta's first black mayor uh, in the early 70s. Did that give you some preparation for telling this story about Atlanta? Well, you know, it was interesting, Tom. When I uh, screened that film, I screened the Maynard film at the Full Frame Documentary Festival. <clears throat> Josh Bennett, who was with Show of Force, had seen the film, and he felt that the one section I did on the Atlanta child murders, could look at, you could do a deeper dive into that. So he, had, he put together a proposal that he didn't show to Maro Chemayoff and Jeff Dupree, who were the partners in Show of Force. And we decided that it could be a, a, a much more, you know, long form series. So we pitched it to Lisa and Nancy and they gave us a green light. And, uh, you know, I didn't think at the time when I did the main documentary that anybody might want to explore the depth that we did with the Atlantis Missing and Murdered. But, uh, it turned out to be a very, very provocative and very challenging series. When you were going into this story, what were the things that you were trying to figure out? One of the things that we felt that was important is that we wanted to make sure that we weren't just doing a crime story, as you just mentioned people talked about, 
we want to take a deeper dive in understanding the city of Atlanta, the context of Atlanta, historically, socially, economically, racially at that time. And from that, we knew that from that we could build out to understanding what happened when these murders began in the city. And so that was the, the sort of the big focus to say, we made sure we wanted to make sure you understood the city of Atlanta. There was this growing metropolis that was attracting a lot, a lot of young black middle-class people. And what did it, what meant, what it meant to that city when they had the first black mayor of a major Southern city, Maynard Jackson. And so all of those elements became part of helping to tell the story and helping us find the characters that we needed to help us get that story on the screen. So if I'm an HBO viewer, I've got an option between uh, comedy by Issa Rae or uh, a film about uh, murdered uh, children, which is very daunting at the best of times. Um, for, for people who want to make the effort to watch this, you know, describe to us why it's worth making that effort. Well, it's, it's, it's worth making the effort because it was a very tragic story that happened in that city. And it's important that people understand what happened, why it happened, you know, when this, what the city went through to sort of try to figure out who the perpetrator was and did they find the right person. You know, I think it's always important with documentaries that it gives a window into people learning about the past. And if you can help people learn about the past, maybe, maybe it can help them sort of not do the things that we see present day or in the future. So I always say that the documentary is a way to, for people to learn. You know, sometimes you don't want to read books, but documentaries like Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, you know, like McMillions, like Aaron's film, gives an opportunity for you to learn something that you might have missed. You know, I, I watched Aaron's film and I watched McMillions the other day and I said, I didn't know those stories. And that's what's always fascinating about documentaries. That's what we did with Atlanta's Missing and Murder. Really reintroduce a large audience to a very important story in the city of Atlanta. Uh, before I move on to the next project, let me ask you, What's it been like for the people whose lives were involved in this case to, to have this film out in the world? Well, many of the parents who were, who lost, tragically lost their children have been, you know, from what we've been told, they've been very, very sort of very positive about their responses to the film. You know, Helen Pugh, you know, Mrs. Leach, Sheila Balthasar, these were mothers who lost their children and they felt like they've never gotten closure. So this film was an opportunity for them to see that the city of Atlanta, you know, as you can see at the beginning of the film with Keisha Lance Bottom, said, we want to change that, that you know, trajectory. And so they may not ever really find out who actually killed all these children, but the city is now taking it upon themselves and said, we need to memorialize and understand the tragedy of what happened and the implications of that and remember these children, remember the lives, the, the young lives lost. All right, uh, thank you, Sam. Um, I'm gonna pleasure. move on to, Aaron Lee Carr's uh, project, I Love You, Now Die, The Commonwealth versus Michelle Carter. Um, let's look at a, a short clip of that. question is, can you cause someone else to commit suicide? Um, Aaron, in the past five years, you've had a string of projects at HBO that include Mommy, Dead and Dearest and At the Heart of Gold. Can you talk about HBO's role in your career? You know, I think that you cannot really talk about true crime without talking about HBO. Um, they are the, you know, this is the sort of the network that, um, you know, really sort of at the inception of, you know, talking about things like Paradise Lost, uh, really thought about, um, you know, what is the story? And then as, uh, as we talked about, and what is the story behind the story and the sort of societal implications. So as a, um, as a filmmaker, I grew up on that. And I always was like, man, maybe I could do that for a living. And uh, there was something. And so when I did my first film, Thought Crimes, The Case of the Cannibal Cop, um, you know, it just was like, I just, I found something that I, um, you know, and I want to say this in a, an okay way, I fell in love with. I really want to be a part in a, the genre of true crime and really thinking about how to elevate it. And so, you know, I've always sort of stuck to this beat 
of, of true crime, but really um, through HBO's mentorship and you know working together, I've really gotten to explore a lot of the concepts around sort of femininity. You'll notice that my last three films were about women, um, and so that's what I felt you know the most grateful that it's you know it's not just the craziest crime stories, but it's really about the ones that we feel like we can add to the dialogue. So in this case, I love you now. Die. Michelle Carter was seventeen years old when she sent these text messages to her 18 year old boyfriend. Um, and what was it about this case that, that this specific case that drew you in? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you can look at this case and not want to make a documentary about it or watch it, but maybe that's just my sort of messed up brain. But I, you know, I saw text messages from Michelle Carter, I think it was in the Washington Post in 2015 about it's now or never, you have to do it drink bleach. Uh, and these were things that Michelle Carter said to a human being that is no longer here. And so a part of me was just like, there has to be more to this story. Why would, an, why would a person text those things? It just doesn't make sense. And so we were able to be like, you know, we went to uh, the trial and had the only camera inside the courtroom, but it was about what happened in the courtroom, but what happened in all the days before, that came before that. And so it really was doing that. And I'm somebody that sends a lot of text messages. Like I, I checked, it's like 140 a day or something bizarre and weird. And I thought to myself, what is it, you know, what is it, what would it be like if somebody looked at all of my text messages? So putting that sort of uh, under the microscope and trying to think critically about that. So what your film does is, you know, what we'd read about this case before were, you know, those, that short window of text messages leading up to Conrad Roy's uh, death, you really opened up uh, this case and gave it more context. What was your process of exploring that? Was it during the trial? Was it through other kinds of reporting? Yeah, I remember I was sitting with Allison Byrne, my co-producer, and we had rented a house in Massachusetts and we printed all, all the text messages and I was wearing like fuzzy slippers and like highlighting it. And I was like, wait, this is so weird. I mean, it was just pages upon pages. There were like 10,000 text messages. And so what, you know, without calling anybody out, I think that the story often just thought about this time period in July when the sort of the intense text messages started to when he unfortunately um, passed away and killed himself. And so it's opening it up and understanding it. So I really wanted to look at the totality of the evidence uh, you know, looking at what are the text messages that sort of came before. So it really was a process of, I got to the story and I felt one way and I won't say what it is because, uh, you know, I want to leave that as a part of the mystery. But I think that, you know, uh, every, I was listening to the amazing podcast with Dean Piquet the other day and he said, a reporter should get on a plane and not know the story that they're going to write. And so it's been this really big sort of growth process for me as a filmmaker of when I think I know something, how do I challenge it? How do I push that? What do I do? And something I see so evident in Sam's film and Brian's film. Oh. Um, for my last question for this segment, last year you published a memoir about your father, the journalist David Carr called All That You Leave Behind. But what are the lessons that you take from him that that apply to work like uh, I Love You Now Die? Yeah, I think that so I, I loved writing the book about my dad and I think but it was so painful to make these films and he he never saw them like he never saw Mommy Dendiris or my last two films and so in sort of reporting out the book and looking at sort of like a, a thousand emails, you can see that evidence and sort of digital communication is a is a key point of my sort of personhood. Um, but I really got to, um, you know, understand like his sort of perspective on things and studying him. So when I would sit with uh, Nancy and Lisa, uh, I've already put in like my dad's notes or what I think my dad's notes are, which is a little bit bizarre. But I think that I've been, you know, I've been so lucky to be supported by so many great mentors. And I think that it really was, he just said, you know, you know, get a beat and be really great at it and do your homework. Uh, I'll come back to you and Sam uh, in a minute. But let me bring in Brian Lazarte uh, of McMillions. Um, let's watch a 30 second spot for McMillions. From 1989 to 2001, there were almost no legitimate million dollar winners in the McDonald's Monopoly game. How crazy is that? The game pieces are being stolen. This could be organized crime. McDonald's could not believe it. No one knew how big this was. 
If you said to me to describe the story, I would say, don't believe it, but it's true. So, uh, Brian, uh, you and James Lee Hernandez, uh, uh, your co-writer, made this story. Um, and now we look at it and it's got HBO behind it and Mark Wahlberg behind it. Uh, but w I know that when you started, you did not have that uh, kind of resource behind you. C can you describe the beginnings of this project? This project is, is definitely the culmination of my partner, James Hernandez, who you just mentioned, and myself. Uh, just having the passion to pursue this incredible story. James actually first came upon this in 2012 on a Reddit article and uh, started looking into it, couldn't find anything, filed a FOIA request, and then three years later got filed and asked me to have lunch one day and say, hey, I think there's a, a really interesting story about the McDonald's Monopoly fraud case, which at that point I also had never heard of. Uh, I'd played the game, both of us were fans of the game, so it was sort of that shock moment of how big was this, and we started talking about it, and we started just, I mean, we were working at our job, so whatever, we, we, we made it a mandatory, every Thursday we would have a, a, a meeting about it, every Sunday we would meet in person, uh, and then we just kept diving into the story, we kept getting, we, we started going through all the evidence and the files that we did have and then uh we filmed some stuff and as soon as we got doug matthews and federal prosecutor mark Devereux on tape it was like okay there's a lot to this and uh we were lucky enough to to partner with mark Wahlberg, steve levinson and archie gibbs's company and bring it to lisa nancy and and off to the races it was a it was a wild dream come true journey in a lot of ways uh, as filmmakers for us. Now, I mean, at first look, this might look like, you know, a victimless crime, you know, stealing McDonald's uh, game pieces, um, but there were real life consequences in this. Can, can you talk about the you know, kind of deep experience that this was for, for many of the people involved? Yeah, I mean, t you know, to your point, most people do make that assumption. They think, oh, they were just stealing from McDonald's, major billion dollar corporation. It wasn't hurting anybody. But in fact, we really wanted to focus on the, the personal effect that this had on not only those who participated, but in, in the long run, the people at the marketing company, the people, the Bittler brothers, the, the printing company, who all lost their jobs as a result of this one person's greed. And so, uh, and then you, you factor in the children, right? The children of those who are affected and, and the stain that it left on uh, on their lives, the effect that it had with going to school, with friendships, work opportunities. And so there were, I mean, the FBI will say the American public was a victim also because no one ever had a real chance to win the game. But for well over a decade, people were stealing the, these game pieces and profiting from them. And, uh, and no, nobody who actually was, was doing it really thought that this was going to turn to a federal crime. And we'd often thought that this was a, um, a very relatable story because back in the 90s, everyone played that game. Everyone wanted to win. And we all felt that, you know, if a friend or family member had come up to you and offered you a chance to claim the prize and all you had to do was tell the white lie that you were the one who peeled the game piece, most people would have done it. And so it's really easy to almost in a way criminalize many of the people who who participated, and some of them rightfully uh, were knowing what they were getting themselves into. But for some, it was, uh, it was an, they just saw it as an opportunity. And uh, I think we all can relate to that in some way. So yeah, you had an incentive to tell the story. The people who lived through this story, some of them must have had a powerful incentive to want to walk away from the story and, uh, and not to uh, go deeper into it. Um, can you talk about the process of, you know, getting people to, to tell you their story and, you know, what you went through, if you can give maybe one example? Uh, sure. I mean, the FBI out of the gate was, was very open and agreeable, happy to share a story that no one had ever heard. And it's a, it's an old case, so it's, it's nice, but the, 
it, it's nice to actually be able to talk about something that they can talk about because a lot of cases with the FBI, they can't share. Uh, but as far as those who participate in the game, this is a, like I said, a, a giant stain in their life and something that they aren't very proud of. So it wasn't an easy conversation to have to say, hey, come on camera and share your part of the story. But we always felt that it's best, and, and I think Aaron even recently mentioned that, it, you know, it's, it's best to go into things without knowing what the full story is and having an open mind that, look, they're a part of the story, but your voice, you telling your version of the story is more powerful than just hearing from the FBI's point of view in this, uh, or what uh, might exist in court documents as a result of what you went through. And so we really approached it from wanting to hear from everybody involved. And, and, uh, and it really proved true that in a lot of cases, I mean, Gloria Brown, who, who was in episode three, uh, you get to really understand that, okay, she participated in this, but she she really felt trapped. She really felt like if she didn't go through with it, her life was in jeopardy. And to put your, you know, have the audience put themselves in that position, we felt was was really important to understand that, okay, good people sometimes do bad things. You know, we all make mistakes, uh, but often most of our mistakes or maybe even our largest mistake in life isn't put out there for the world to see in the national spotlight. McDonald's as a corporation, you know, they out of the gate, they were not uh, as excited to participate. But the more we talk to them, like, like anybody, it's people behind a corporation. So ultimately, we felt like we were able to, to let them know our position on it, why we felt it was important. And they just had to go through all the red tape and multiple corporate steps to uh, to make that decision to participate. But again, we're glad that they did because it, it it added value to to seeing the whole picture, which was important for us. Um, Nancy and Lisa, let me uh, bring you back into this. You know, every documentary maker has a unique strength, and and I wonder if I could ask uh, you two to, to comment on the, the three filmmakers here on Sam and Aaron and Brian, what you think their individual strengths are that, that come out in their filmmaking. I was thinking of what, um, what connects them. And I think what connects all of them is this incredible ability to create empathy for people going through what may seem like extraordinary circumstances, very different from your own. But once you, engage with the film and the way that they tell the story and the trust that they engender with the different subjects, uh, you then, you know, experience the story in a new way. You may think you know the Atlanta child murder story or the McDonald's fraud story through their access to, to subjects and their relationship with subjects and even to archive material, you, you create an empathy that you didn't have before. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what we were just talking about, which which Nancy points to, which is these are filmmakers who real people trust. And um, that is an enormous thing in documentary filmmaking. And we're not dealing with actors and we're not dealing with scripts. And once these stories go out in the world, it has a huge impact on them. And so we uh, love working with the three of these folks and their uh, partners because we know they're moving forth in good faith. And when they're talking to subjects, uh, they're able to engender trust because they um, feel deeply for them and they're not out to demonize anyone. They're really just trying to get at a new, uh, a new look at the truth. And I think the subjects feel that and the interviews in the film illuminate that. Um, Sam and Aaron and Brian, I, I want to ask you about your collaborative process with HBO. Uh, I've seen Lisa before on films and I've gotten notes back from them. Uh, Sam, can I start with you? Can, can you talk about, you know, what the notes you got from HBO, uh, how that contributed to your project? I would say this, you know, very simply, Tom. I mean, you know, we showed our cuts to Nancy and Lisa all through the process and you know, the thing that's always great about HBO is that, you know, both of them understand the sensitivity of the material. They also understand that we're filmmakers who have a voice, but they're able to give us notes and thoughts about structure and characters and the dynamics of the piece that we all found very helpful. I mean, we initially had a three-part series, you know, and it was going to be much longer each episode. 
And then when Nancy and Lisa had seen, I guess, the third version, third rough cut, they all felt that, they both felt that the this, this series could be longer, that we could stretch it out, that there was so much material that people need to, had to focus on and grab onto that it might be difficult for them to get it in three, one and a half, over one, over one hour segments. We were like, oh my God, we got to go back now and rethink how to restructure this. But we were able to do it. And I thought it was a great thing that they said to say they're the cream of the crop in terms of being able to give us great feedback. And, you know, from my experiences working with them when I did Spike's films and on this series, it's always been a very good, you know, collaboration where I never felt at all that we were being told what to do. They, they open, they're open to us. And they, they listen and we listen to them. And that's always good when you're collaborating, making documentaries. You have to pay attention and listen. Um, Aaron, in the case of uh, your project, uh, was there a note that you got back from HBO that was meaningful? Well, first off, I have been on that Reddit thread, Brian, every single week, and I have never gotten a documentary idea out of it. So <laughs> that's like the holy grail of, uh, and I, I, it's like, I think it's Today I Learned. It was a Today yeah. I Learned segment. Yeah. I was looking at that before. Yeah. So anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that in terms of this project, HBO <coughs> process. I mean, I, I just think it's it's sort of you know the trust. I think that there's it's you know you have like a bag of money and you have to say this is how I'm going to spend it. I'm going to spend it wisely. And it isn't this process of well we got to check with you what you're doing every stuff. Like there's been an implicit trust um, with Andrew Rossi and me and Lisa and Nancy and HBO. And like you know it's there's a thing where um, a lot of networks might say you have to get this person you have to get access for us to agree to do it. And of course, some stories may need that, right? You need Dave Math, uh, you need the FBI agent for this one. You need, you know, uh, people in Sam's film. But I think that what was so sort of um, crucial for me uh, was that nobody ever said you need to get Michelle Carter in order to make this two-part series. And I think that's something that the industry should sort of, um, you know, without being like a school marm, like take notice. I think that we can create incredible television, incredible cinema, uh, without having the exact same person. And I have had, you know, the previous two films, I had the main subjects, and with Michelle Carter, I didn't have Michelle Carter, because she, she was in an ongoing legal process, um, and I was petrified. I would lie awake at night being like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna make this? Am I gonna live up to HBO's expectations? And it was just like step by step, process by process. How can you bring this person into the forefront of the film? And there's a way to do this and there's a way to go from there, from here. And so that's been the process. And like, that's just what I would love, you know, for the industry to be a part of. Yes, access is incredible. It's important. But also like thinking about what are the other sort of elements of the story that make it special? You know, we live in that collaborative space of like, oh, how can we, how can we pull this off? How can we elevate this? And, and we both are the type of uh, filmmaker that, is always challenging ourselves, And so when you're in, in the trenches with someone who is like that, and then you're challenging each other, you're, you're building that possibility of what it could become. And, and to extend that, to have the support of Lisa Nancy and, 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 and the full team of, of HBO behind us, uh, really is just, it's, it's, it's amplifying the possibilities to a, another level. Talking about the podcast, it was just, it was an evolution of, hey, there's so much more to this story. How can we bring some of these things to life and to do it in a really fun, creative way, which part of our series was, was really fun and had this quirky bit to it, even though it had a serious side to it. And again, in that same essence and, and spirit of, of being collaborative and pushing the boundaries and sort of, you know, taking true crime, which we've, we've heard in the podcast space, but to have this, uh, you know, not so much a, like, like a comedy component to true crime, but there's a quirkiness and, uh, and, and they really embrace. I want to keep this close to 30 minutes, but let me just take an audience question um, to put to all three of you. You know, when you're embarking on a project, this might take a year of your time, two years, several years of your time. What's the thing that, you know, that causes you to say, yes, I'm going to go in on this project? Uh, Sam, can I start with you? The thing that always attracts me to a project is the complexity of it. 
the fact that there's no sort of clear black and white to the story and that there's going to be some complexity and you're going to walk away thinking, hmm, maybe I could think this way about it or maybe I could think this way about it. That's always what's very attractive to me when I'm, when I'm doing these, looking for new projects and developing new projects, complexity. You know, that to me adds drama and it adds sort of the kind of thing that always makes me interested as a human being because I don't believe life is black and white and so I like to have films that are the same way. Uh, Aaron, can I, can I get your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for me, it's um, does what I uh, could say about this, does it feel unique? Is it adding to the discussion? And then I have a process of in looking at the research, do I spend multiple hours? Do I go late into the night? Do, is it, you know, 11 p.m. Um, PM or 2 a.m.? Am I still thinking about this? And then I ask a couple of friends who I call like creative consigliaries. I was like, would you sit and watch a four hour thing about this? And I, and I let them answer. Like if they say yes, or I would, or no, please don't. Then I sort of listen. And so it's sort of a, um, a gut check from people in my life uh, who I'm open to feedback. But it's really, it's like, you know, it's a very high bar to be making films for HBO. And so it's like, I probably have 20 ideas and like two will make it, you know, I think. And then, yeah, it's the, the year long toil of, is this going to work or is it not going to work? Uh, Brian, you've been several years on uh, McMillions. Uh, next time you see a story idea on Reddit, um, what's, what's going to, what are you going to need to feel reassured about before you take that on? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, James was the one who first discovered the, the Reddit. I was lucky enough to be brought into this. And, uh, you know, what I think the core to any great story is, uh, is surprise. Like, I, I want to be surprised along the way. And, and if, I, if I continue to be surprised, and it has, as Sam was pointing out, the complexity, it is going to fuel my passion. And, and when I and I, James shares the same mentality. When something is in our sight, it becomes that obsess, uh, that obsession to get to the bottom of it, to figure out what hasn't been figured out before. And when you find yourself going down that road of not being able to stop thinking about it in, you know, in the morning and at night as you're falling asleep, and just what else do you have to, to do to, to solve the next mystery in this process and and that is that, that that's a fuel that excites me personally about storytelling and uh and the discovery of new characters that can be the voices which make documentary film and filmmaking so exciting i think personally to myself because you can use those individual voices and these characters to shape a narrative well, uh, I hope viewers get a chance to see all of these uh, films. Uh, Sam Pollard's The Atlantas, Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children, Aaron Lee Carr's I Love You Now Die, The Commonwealth versus Michelle Carter, and Brian Lazarte and James Hernandez's uh, McMillions. Thanks very much for being a part of this. Thank you.